Blood on the River, Chapter 12, Page 89. Wingapo, hello, literally my beloved friend. Pakatawar, fire. Atons, arrows. Netapu, friends. Marapu, enemies. Werewants, chief, literally, he is wealthy. From an Algonquin English word list compiled by Thomas Harriet, John Smith, and William Strachey. The next morning, Captain Smith does not bring me a musket. He brings me a book. It is well worn and the stitching is coming loose. I sound out the letters of two of the words on the cover. Thomas Harriet. Thomas Harriet lived in the Roanoke colony, Captain Smith explains. He learned much of the Algonquin language, wrote it down, brought his papers back to England, and they were published in this book. I want you to learn these words. They will be better protection than any weapon. I open the book. The pages hold two columns. On the left are words I understand. Man, houses, shoes, axe, sea turtle. On the right are strange words I've never seen before. Nemera, Yehawkins, Moccasins, Tomahawk, Terrapin. Farther down the page is a word with no English translation next to it. I sound it out. Raccoon, I say. What does that mean? It's an animal we don't have in England, he says. You'll see one soon enough, especially if you're out at night. It's a bit like a small badger with black circles around its eyes. Raccoon, I say again, trying to imagine such an animal. I find numbers. One, two, three is translated Nikut Ning Nus. This language will be your protection outside the fort and within it as well, he says. I know he means that this will make me valuable as a translator to the gentleman, who might have little use for me otherwise. I am disappointed that I won't be learning to use a musket, but the new world words roll off my tongue and make me feel as if there is power in them. And so every day we drill, just like the young Powhatan boys who don't get their breakfast until they have shot their targets, I do not get my breakfast until I have done a bit of sword fighting and learned at least two new words in Algonquin. In June, Captain Smith's name is finally cleared, and he is sworn in on the council. Maybe it is because he has been too busy lately to insult the gentleman every single day, or because Reverend Hunt has interceded for him yet again, or simply because the council members see that they need his good sense and important skills. At last, Captain Smith has been given the position that the Virginia Company assigned to him. On June 22nd, Captain Newport and the rest of the mariners set sail for England. They carry loads of clapboards and sassafras root, and barrels of tiny, shiny rocks that we hope contain gold. They sail away in the Susan Constant and the Godspeed, and leave the discovery and the shallop for us to use for travel here in Virginia. Captain Newport also takes all the food stores except 14 weeks worth of wheat and barley for the 100 or so of us colonists. He say he will return with fresh stores by October. He begins a few days after Captain Newport leaves. First one man, then another, then five more, then a dozen, all groaning and feverish with swollen faces and bloody diarrhea. Never have I heard such sounds of misery, the moaning and whimpering, the begging to be released from their bodies. And then they begin to be released, sometimes one, sometimes two or three, turning up stiff and cold in the morning. I feel dizzy and nauseated, but I am able to stand, and so I help to drag the bodies outside the fort and dig graves. Soon there are so many sick that there is no one with strength to tend the gardens, no one with strength to hunt or fish. We are left with a cup of barley and a cup of wheat for each man per day, and this is filled with wriggling mealworms. I help cook the grains in the big pot over our communal cook fire, and I watch as the mealworms float to the top. As we grow hungrier, more and more men become ill. Those who still have the energy to argue have theories about what is causing the sickness. It's a curse. The savages have cursed us, one man says. No, you're wrong. It's the filthy river water, says another. It's salty at high tide and slimy at low tide, and it's all we've got to drink. You're both wrong. It's starvation, pure and simple, comes another explanation. There's more worms than grains in our meal. No, 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 it's the wet and chill that's killing us. The rain comes right into my tent, and I sleep shivering every night. Sleep? Who gets to sleep? I'm on watch every third night. A man can't stay healthy when he gets no rest. 
You're all wrong, says yet another. It's Ratsbane. There's a Spanish spy among us, and he has poisonous us all. I know arsenic poisoning when I see it. But soon even those who think they have an explanation are too sick for discussion. Captain Smith falls ill. Then Captain Gosnold and Master Percy. Then Richard, too, and Reverend Hunt. Some days I cannot stand. I lie in my bed, groaning from the pain in my belly. Whether it is from hunger, poison, or sickness, all I know is that I am miserable. On the days when I can move, I bring food and water to Captain Smith, Reverend Hunt, and Richard. They are all sicker than I. Richard just looks at me when I bring him the salty water and warmy grain. I wonder if he thinks I am bringing him such bad fare out of spite and not because it is all we have. His eyes are glassy, with a faraway look. I think he will likely die even before the two of us have had a chance to put the past behind us and become friends. Henry is still up and around, doing his chores for President Wingfield, but Abram is ill. President Wingfield himself is in the finest of health. I hear Henry and Abram whispering one night when I, they think I'm asleep. I stole an egg for you. You have to eat it raw, says Henry. I hear the crackling of eggshell and loud slurping. I'll get you some wine tomorrow. Meat too. I told him if he doesn't share the stores with you and me, he'll be doing his own laundry and mending soon. I suck in my breath. They've got eggs? We ate all our chickens weeks ago and shared the last eggs all around. At least we thought those were the last eggs. What's that? Henry's voice startles me. You're awake then, you scum? Suddenly his thick hand is at my throat and his dark form looms over me. You heard nothing. Do you understand me? He hisses. We are very close to the other tent, so he speaks softly, but with cold meanness. Nothing. I try to nod, but his hand clamps harder on my throat. I can't breathe. Swear it, he demands. Swear in God's name you will tell no one what you heard. I swear it, I croak. He gives my throat one last shake, then releases me. Speak of it, and you will die, he says. I have no doubt he means it. He is protecting his master. Without his master, Henry may be of no use to anyone. He might not even be worth his share of dwindling food rations. He is protecting himself. I lie in the dark, listening to Richard's ragged breathing. Will he die with his last memory of me being something mean I said to him or did to him? And what of Captain Smith and Reverend Hunt? Will they die and leave me with no one to be my ally against the anger and whims of the gentleman or of Henry? The next morning, two more corpses are dragged out of the tents. I am barely able to stand, but I will help to dig the graves. In my head, I count up how many of us there are left and realize we have buried half our men. The savages might as well come finish us off now, I hear men say, and will disappear just like the Roanoke colony did. And all the while, Master Wingfield eats his meat and drinks his wine. John Layden brings two shovels, one for me and one for him. We don't go far from the fort to dig the graves. Two soldiers come with us as guards. As we dig, we look warily around, hoping there are no Indians to shoot at us today. If we had more strength and more courage, we could go into the forest to hunt and bring back fresh meat. But too many men have gone to hunt and have staggered back into the fort with arrows in their bellies, only to die in agony a few days later. And now I know there is meat and eggs within the walls of our fort. Captain Smith is looking a little better today. He is up on his own, and so I will not need to bring him breakfast. I bring a bowl of warmy grains to Reverend Hunt in his tent. He is pale and lean, his cheeks sunken in. When I hand him the bowl, he fumbles with it and nearly drops it. Can he live much longer on this foul food and salty water? Reverend Hunt, I have a question, I say. He nods. He is ready to listen. If I am sworn not to do something, sworn in God's name, must I keep my word? He frowns. Who has made you swear something in God's name? He demands. I hang my head. I cannot tell this, or Henry will clamp his hand around my throat until there is no breath left in me. Reverend Hunt's hand shakes as he lifts a spoonful of gruel to his mouth. He chews, thinking, then speaks. If you will not tell me all of it, I cannot give you an answer. But you are capable of finding the answer on your own. Your heart will know better than your head. Choose the path of love and not of fear. The choice you make out of love will always be the right one. I leave him and go to chop wood for the cook fire. 
With the last of my strength, I slam my frustration into the wood with my axe. I hate Henry. I hate being afraid of him. If I keep my sworn oath to him, is that a choice made out of love? No, it is a choice made out of fear. Have I grown to love Reverend Hunt with his patience and wisdom and his love for me? Yes. I throw down the axe. I have made my decision. I will tell what I have sworn not to tell. I go to find Captain Smith where he is helping John Layden to split clapboard. They are both weak and the work is growing, growing slowly. Captain Smith, I say, I would like to speak to you in private.